I love change. If you don't like change, how do you like irrelevance? So I love change. <laughs> I just don't give up. I will just chomp onto somebody's ankle and not let go until I get what I want. <laughs> and uh, Sounds like an entrepreneur. <laughs> Whatever your strengths are, double down on them because yeah. that's where you've got momentum. And if you try to just always work on your weaknesses, you're just taking on water. I'm Claudia Healy, the CHRO of STO Building Group, and I'm privileged to be here today to moderate the podcast with these remarkable women. Jane, Julie, and Natalie have each led successful careers and are still active today, in addition to being members of the STO Building Group Board of Directors. Each is also on several committees as well. So let's take a moment to get to know each of these leaders and the career journey that they have each been on to get to where they are today. Then we'll explore insights and pearls of wisdom that they have to share. So we'll get to know these, these ladies a little bit more intimately now. So ladies, please share with our listeners who you are, a bit of the backstory of your leadership and your career story as well. And within your introduction, please finish by completing this sentence from a very young age, I dot, dot, dot. So let's start with Natalie. You're the most recent member of our board here. So Natalie, take us away. Yeah, happy to do that, Claudia. And thanks for having me. Uh, from a very young age, I knew that I wanted to be in public service. Uh, my mother gave me a book uh, when I was in high school that got me interested in economics. And I took every economics class I could take and uh, eventually found myself uh, working for Utah governors. I worked for three different Utah governors, uh, eventually um, did a tour of duty in Washington, D.C., as they say in public policy, uh, worked uh, for George W. Bush as a political appointee. And then I've spent my last 10 years uh, leading a public policy institute in the state of Utah at the University of Utah. I'm a Westerner uh, by birth and by preference. I love the mountains. I'm an active skier, uh, love to hike, and spend a lot of time in the beautiful Red Rock, uh, the national parks that we call home in, in the state of Utah. And it's been a real privilege to uh, serve as a, as a director on the STO Building Group Board. Well, it's great to have you. Julie, how about you? You're the, the, the second newest here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Julie Schoenfeld. And from a very early age, I always knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, the reason is that my father was an entrepreneur. We had kind of a crazy life in that we're not always sure that the payroll was going to be made. And, you know, my mother would have to tighten her belt and figure out how she was going to pay for the groceries for the six kids. And I always thought, what an exciting way to live. <laughs> so, uh, but I didn't just start out saying, I'm going to just jump in and become an entrepreneur. I went to engineering school, got an engineering degree and an MBA. And I decided, well, if you're going to learn how to run a company, you should go work for good companies, companies that are very well run. So I went and joined Procter & Gamble, and I had a job at Hewlett Packard, and I kind of did every position you could do from sales, marketing, operations, finance, till I finally started my own company uh, back in the first internet wave. Uh, and it was a chat company that was acquired by one of the early search engines called Ask Jeeves, uh, which was a really uh, up and down crazy time. And from there, I led four venture-backed startups. My most recent startup was a sensor for the self-driving car that was acquired by General Motors. And I worked at General Motors for uh, a period of time. So my career has been all over the map. I'm originally from New England. Uh, I grew up in the Boston area, but I've spent the last 30 years in Southern California, uh, a place that is really, really lovely, I might add. Uh, and it's just joyful to be on this panel with all of you, and I appreciate the invitation. And uh, since I have worked for some very well-run companies, I can also say that as the board member of STOBG, this is a very well company, well-run company. Oh, well, thank you, Julie. So Jane, as our, our most senior person here on the board, who've been on our board the longest amount of time, and you're also um, the chair of one of our important committees, the Compensation Committee, um, bring us home and introduce yourself to the team. Thank you, Claudia. Name's Jane Shemalinsky. I've spent most of my life living in the Boston area, another New Englander. I think my accent proves that. Uh, from a young age, I think I was more serious than I probably am today, but I always knew I came from a family that uh, believed in service, believed in the political system and how things work and that there was a path to power through politics enjoyed it immensely. 
Uh, I could have been, I never ever aspired to be in engineering or anything like that. But so my career has been more of a lattice than anything particularly planned. Uh, I always used to laugh. At one point in my life, I thought, I want to live a life that I have the best stories to tell at the nursing home. And that seemed to be something very important to me. I've been in the engineering construction business now 45 years. So I've been at it a long time, seen many changes. But what I've always loved about it, I think, I love the aspects of engineering and construction because it touches everyone's lives. There's so many jobs that, you know, when I think of it, I know it sounds ridiculous, but if you're working in engineering or construction, everybody walks in over, under something you do, mm -hmm. and you do make the world a better place than the built natural and uh, social environment. So it really all came together to be exactly what I wanted to do. And I think everything, every experience brought me to where I am today. And I share with Natalie and Julie that STOBG has been probably one of the most exciting or best experiences in that very long career. Oh, wonderful. You, like I said in the introduction, you, you all three are so amazing. And every time I have the opportunity to speak with you, I find something new. Um, interesting listening to all three of you. You talked about the importance of family uh, in the formative years of who, who you are and who kind of influenced you to become who you are today. And you also talked about service. Every single one of you talked about service being important as well. Um, as you think about as successful leaders, yourselves, but also women often have somebody who believed in them um, at a very early age. As you think about the one special person in your formative years who was that person for you, um, who helped to guide you and to, to give you that inspiration, maybe push you at times um, and help shape your career, who is that person and how did they impact your leadership style and decision making? Jane, would you like to get us started? <clears throat> I would say I had different folks along the way because as it progressed, but at a very early age, I actually had an uncle that was both an attorney and an engineer, and I was fascinated by what he did. And he sort of set that I saw that it was a path to travel, interesting projects, meeting interesting people, and solving really big, big problems. I love the idea of working in the urban environment. How do you change things? So I would say that was the person that might have turned my head that way. But then throughout it, I've had wonderful mentor sponsors that each one taught me something unique and special. That's fantastic. Great. Julie, how about you? Well, when I look back, I, I would say the, the person that really got me going and really believed in me was my father. Uh, he understood what made me tick. Um, when I was leaning toward going to a, a, a liberal arts career, he suggested I become an engineer. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, maybe that's because you think it's too hard and you can't do it. So that's all it took to <laughs> manipulate me into that career, which turned out to be a brilliant maneuver. But over the course of my career, I have noticed that there's always been in every job somebody that believed in me. And they pulled me aside when they saw me going astray or they suggested that I handle things a little bit differently or they gave me some great advice. And so as I hit this stage of my career and I'm at Caltech as the entrepreneur in residence, I feel compelled to do that when I see young entrepreneurs or see young students who are sort of lost in a direction just uh, to pay it forward to all the mentors that helped me along the way. Oh, that's great. I know you're coming my way, Claudia. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, listen, I'm, I'm the youngest of 11 children. So just try to just let that, you know, go over you for just a minute. I have seven older brothers. <laughs> and uh, I, can't, uh, I can't think of anything that's been more influential on me than coming from a large family and being the baby of a mm -hmm. large family. When I grew up, there was already the beauty queen, the artist, the 4.0 student, you know, you know, the athlete. I mean, th there were all these things already filled. And I, I think it took me a very long time to just sort of gain the confidence to know that I had my own path mm. and that I could discover it. Um, I'm no different than, you know, Julie and Jane in the sense that my parents were incredibly formative for me. My mother read to me at a very young age, lots of very intriguing books. Um, you know, she read to me the Gulag Archipelago. 
You at know, what age? Alexander Snow is it's, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm in fourth grade and she's reading me this. Um, the Diary of Anne Frank, I remember very early her reading that to me. And so this, this way that my parents ingrained in me um, this idea of discovery and, and using your intellect to, you know, find answers to things. And then my, my dear father who supported me in internships and, you know, in college and different things. So I, I don't think anybody succeeds alone. It's always a group, a team, a family endeavor. That's great. It's interesting because before, while we were you know, talking and preparing, we were talking about you and, and Jane has said, hey, I think you should actually start a book club. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Leave, it you know Leave it to my Leave mother. Leave it to my mother. Your yeah. mother. Um, but she also um, gleaned that you're really, you're really strong at storytelling and bringing other people along on the journey. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that also might have had its roots very young and early in, yeah. in your life and in your personal family. I, I work in public policy and we spend so much time analyzing data, uh, putting together the evidence. But it turns out that every public policy success is a triumph of communications. Mm -hmm. And I and I think this is a lesson I think all of us would share that it's not enough to just be good at something. You have to be good at explaining something, conveying information. Right. Do you agree, Jane? I mean, in your engineering? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because you're taking complex situations, you need to explain it. So I actually think the best tool I ever had was communication skills or is communication skills. So yeah. totally yeah. agree. Yeah. And and I find that when someone tries to explain something to me and I'm not getting it, mm -hmm. I think, I used to think, what's wrong with me? I don't understand that. I've come to realize that if you can't, if I can't understand what you're saying, you've got the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so communication, yeah. if we're going to give pieces of advice and pearls of wisdom, Storytelling, communication, ability to get your ideas across, selling your ideas is one of the mo most needed skills. Yeah, and I'll just add in public policy work, when I went to Washington, D.C., what I noticed is, you know, in public policy, it's crazy to say this because Washington has so many problems right now, but the very best make it to D.C. in doing what they do. You know, if you're, if you're in charge of air quality at a state level and you go run air quality for a nation, it's because you're really good mm -hmm. at what you do. But what I noticed in the in the public policy professionals in Washington was that they had both the technical skills and the communication skills. That was what differentiated them. And so that I think that's a lesson in corporate America as well, that uh, the people that are our leaders that really succeed are ones that not only know the substance, but know how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I think that goes back to we were also discussing, you need to know your craft. Mm -hmm. That And I think that's something that putting the time in because sometimes it can feel a little laborious. Knowing your craft is incredibly important. And I do believe life is told in stories. Everybody will remember how they were told something versus every number, every perfect PowerPoint. So I really feel the combination of knowing your craft, being comfortable with that, and the ability to communicate is something worth spending time on. Well, and I, I love that too. And, and again, I'm thinking about a story you told us earlier at lunch um, about how you have to prepare. And actually, would you mind just sharing? Because I think this is a real pearl of, of, of wisdom, but it's also an actual strategy, a tip of how you can be best prepared. You don't just show up and miraculously deliver an amazing story that is compelling everybody gets. It, it takes right. work. Can, oh, it do absolutely you mind does. Sure. And I used to have to do a lot of pitches for consultant selection. And one of the things, you only have so much time. And if you go over the time, you're cut short and you possibly could lose this very big job. So in coaching, what they would do is you'd submit your slides. First of all, you had to answer like, so what? Why does that slide really matter? So you did that. And then to keep you on time, it would do your presentation in three minutes, do it in two, do it in one. And it helps you to really focus and strat what was the big important message because the droning on sometimes can really kill you. Well, and, and you make the point that um, you may think before that you've got 10 minutes, but when you're live, you may only have three. And so you have to, in your preparation, be so good that you can give the elevator speech, which is, you know, just 30 seconds or something bigger, exactly. longer. And I would imagine as an entrepreneur, you never know when a pitch is going to come, Julie, right? So you have to be prepared and on your feet at all times. Well, you know, what we're talking about here with communication is an, another way of saying is it's really sales. Mm -hmm. no. And just as a strange anecdote in my career, at one point in my career, I, at age 30, I was the uh, 
officer of a publicly traded company and I went to a startup because I wanted, before I ran my own, I wanted to learn how to do this. And I was the vice president of marketing for the startup. And all of a sudden the company got acquired that I was working for. And I was only there like three weeks. And so the VP of marketing job was going to another person in the acquisition. So all of a sudden I was adrift and I decided, you know, I might as well use this as an opportunity. They needed a sales rep. I was the, you know, I, I was fairly high up in the organization. And I said, you know what, give me a bag. I'm going to go out and sell. Yeah. This turned out to be probably the pivotal move of my career because what I learned is that as an entrepreneur, as a business person, as a public policy person, you are always selling. And when you don't get your point across or you lose, somebody sold better than you. Mm -hmm. And if you're an entrepreneur, your employees, they don't want to work for someone. You're selling them to come be with you. And uh, so if we we're on other pearls of wisdom is learn how to sell because you'll be doing it every day of your life. Yeah. I want to add to that. Um, I love the point and totally agree with it. There's also something about that you had a transition that you went through, mm -hmm. you know, that you had to pick up and do sales. And I have found uh, very specific moments in my career where an inflection point happened and you had to decide whether to cross that bridge. Uh, mine came. So I, I was a professional economist. I'm, I'm helping to forecast revenues. I'm looking at uh, the out economic outlook. And I worked with the media a lot in doing that. And I had a governor who said to me, will you come be my spokesperson? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you don't take economists mm -hmm. and make them <laughs> spokespeople or running the media shop of a governor's office. But um, I, I made that transition. And, and this governor told me that if I could combine my technical skills with the ability to work with the media or to work with communications. So that would, that would serve me well. So I latched onto it and you learn the same thing in yeah. sales. Yeah. And I'll bet you have examples of uh, hinge points where you took a challenge and combined fields and something good happened. Oh, absolutely. There's always pivot points. Yeah. And I think you just have to figure out and it kind of goes to decision-making that I don't think there's really bad decisions. You just have to be willing to accept the consequences if it isn't what you expected and dust yourself off and get up and do it yep. again. Yep. So I think those pivots probably define you more than the great success stories. Yeah. It is the pivots. And, and they can be terrifying. I, I remember when I made this decision to become a sales rep, people were saying, you went to engineering school, you got sense. your MBA at Harvard, and now you want to be a sales rep? Like <laughs> incredulous. And uh, something inside me just said, you know what, this is a skill you need to know. So within the first five months, I tripled what I was making salary wise <laughs> as a VP of marketing. And uh, then from there, it just I, I realized that that you walk into a room and, you know, I used to be able to feel the energy in the room thanks to sales. And the sales job is you you run at this door as hard and as fast as you can and three times you smash into the wall and the fourth time someone opens the door. And so if you want a career as an entrepreneur, that would be my description. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be absolutely terrifying and also humbling in some ways as well, because here you are at this pivot point. You think you're, you're going to do one thing and then you take a few steps backwards. I think you talked about sort of a career lattice. It's not just a, a straight trajectory to the top. You all just were talking about different key critical points in your careers and key milestones. Um, and several of them were terrifying at the, at the <laughs> moment, but turned out gratefully, very successfully. Can you tell us about when you, as you reflect on those moments, um, did you have any mentors who were in your life and in your career who in particular helped you to give you the courage, support, truth, um, or that really helped to make a difference or, or did you just manage it on your own? <laughs> I'm going to go, no, of course, <laughs> of course, I, of course you did. No, Jane. <laughs> no I, I think everybody does. I can't imagine that anyone ever stepped into some of these situations and it became abundantly clear. Again, though, I think it's at different points. There were some times it was worrying more about maybe getting ahead. Mm -hmm. Then you want to be better at something. Then you might want new and more creative outlets, but always there was someone, but I would say more than mentors, there were sponsors. Okay. So I probably believe more in a sponsorship model than a mentor. And I think the difference is 
In life, you sort of hope when 12 people are together talking, at least eight of them kind of like you, and that's what your sponsor does. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. If I look back, um, I have very distinct mentors, all male, hmm. all male. Um, you know, one in economics, uh, you know, two in public policy. Uh, the current president of the University of Utah is a mentor to me. I, I really respect his leadership. But they've all been men, which is interesting. Uh, not surprising, right, Julie? Not, uh, all, all of them, because at our age, yeah, that's who was in charge. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How did you develop mentors and sponsors in your career? Because I, I hear that a lot from, from people who are coming into organizations and they're just planning their career and they're looking at more senior positions and, and people are telling them, you need a sponsor. And they're like, great, where do I sign that sponsor up? <laughs> How did you go about developing those relationships with both mentors and sponsors? We probably all had both. Um, they do different things and serve different needs, but they, they take cultivating or, or earning um, that kind of a relationship. How did you approach that? So, so this is one of those things that happens, in my opinion, very organically. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like getting married. You, you, you know, you either like a person or you don't. And what I find in, in the, the generation that's coming up right now is that they're told, go find a mentor, go find a mentor. But that wasn't how it happened right. in our day and age. Uh, people would just sort of gravitate to you and give you advice and it would just happen. So I, I would say that just looking, saying, looking at someone saying, boy, she has great uh, skills. I wish I, she would be my mentor. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is, you know, someone sees you in a meeting and you say, hey, what'd you think of my presentation? You just develop a real honest to goodness relationship. And then the mentorship occurs. The other thing that I would say if we're, again, I'm giving a few pieces of advice is I, I am mentoring a lot of people. And the ones I remember are the ones who stay in touch, who say thank you, who don't waste my time and recognize that the wisdom that is being exchanged is is a gift and you feel appreciated. Not that I do it for that, but um, I would just say that it's it, recognize that people who have achieved what my colleagues here have achieved, their time is very precious. And uh, it's nice to be able to help young people coming along. I'm, I'm in the same camp as Julie on this. I think that mentorships are... Um, they're organic in the sense that you have a shared, almost like worldview or something with the person that, that you're mentoring or being mentored by. At least that's been my mm -hmm. experience. And uh, this person will have an eye for you and you'll have an eye for them. And then an affection develops and um, the rest, you know, comes naturally. I do think, though, there's something about the person being the bright spot. Mm -hmm. I often found that through my career and I'd be mentoring people and I'd realize all they wanted to do was complain. <laughs> and I just thought life is just too short for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So you also have to work at kind of being the bright spot, asking the questions, saying please and thank you, and kind of having an understanding of where you want to go. And I will say at least my experience was everybody always thought as I went up, it was like, oh, you broke the class ceiling. That was the easiest thing. It was getting off the sticky floor <laughs> because that was the tough thing, getting that first break that put you in the path. But that's probably what I look at more now when I'm involved with companies to see who are those people that really are the bright spot. They're just stuck on that sticky floor, male or female. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's super interesting to think of it that way. And I also think that the people that have been so influential to me, they were givers. They, they helped me. And um, that's, it, it was their generosity that helped me. And I, I just think we all have to think of that. How can we help others? Yeah, I think as I'm listening to you all, it, it, there is a common thread again that runs through. You have to be amazing at what you're doing for people to want to invest the time. So they're, mm -hmm. they're seeing that you are worthy of that investment of their time, which they have a limited amount of. And they know by investing in you that you're going to benefit. And then there's, and you're going to continue to learn and grow. And there's nothing more rewarding than seeing people that you're mentoring or sponsoring move on and learn and grow and do bigger and better things in their careers and, and achieve their full potential, yeah. right? Don't forget the value of just asking the question, how can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> so if you're doing that to people, they'll mentor you if you have that sort of attitude that you're there to serve and help. Again, back to that service mentality. Yeah. Right? But I will also say is over the years, I run internship programs. And I found out a long time ago that if you bring on one intern 
you could bring on 10 interns. It's about the same amount of work. You still have to figure out how to keep an intern busy. But every time I run an intern program, and these are sometimes the earliest I ever did it was seniors in high school, but I do college and grad students. And what I found in the companies where I brought interns in, I always got way more back than I gave to that intern program because interns and young people come in with an energy and enthusiasm. So there's a great exchange uh, if you're open to it. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm curious. Do you feel that some days you're as much the student as the teacher? All the time. I mean, yeah. I, I'm at uh, Caltech and I'm meeting with professors every day and I'm looking at fields from quantum computing to drug discovery, to artificial intelligence. In fact, some days I come home and I think I cannot fit one more fact into my brain. <laughs> so uh, it's joyful to be kind of a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it brings happiness, really. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's wonderful. So you all have made it to, you know, incredible heights in your career. Um, and I'm sure that it wasn't always easy. And I'm sure there are plenty of times that you actually didn't get the big job, that for one reason or another, somebody else got that job. I'm curious as women, um, women executives and leaders, was there ever a moment in your career at any of those critical milestones or moments where you felt like your gender played a role in you getting a role or not getting a role? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll give it to you now. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, my personal opinion is I've been the beneficiary of um, a lot of uh, great opportunities because I am a woman and I've also been denied opportunities as a woman. Yeah. And I, I just think that's just reality and you just work from there. Um, in the end, if you're adding value, you're found. You know, you, you might be, you know, passed over once, but you won't be passed over forever. I don't know, Jane? No, I would agree, but I think really... What I found interesting, when I truly became committed to something, that's when I became the success. And it wasn't about being committed to getting that job, that role, that. It was, and I think it's Gatha, there's a quote, when you're truly committed, the world will conspire to make you a success. And that has been very true in my life. I also think when you get rejected, you know, lick your wounds, but get up again. I mean, we talked so many times about the mental toughness as you move up, because I had jobs that were so comfortable, I could do them on automatic pilot, just didn't want to live that life. But you have to be willing to accept there will be a no, have the mental toughness and move on. And it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is ego. You feel embarrassed. <laughs> but yeah, I'd probably do something way worse than that to be embarrassed about. So, so on the male-female thing, when I, when I was a sales rep, my big pivotal job. Um, what I noticed is as a woman, I could get the, I could get the meeting. People like to hear a female voice at the time that let me. So I would always get the meeting. And then if something bad happened in the sales process, no one would yell at me. Now that on the other hand, the men, they could go out and, you know, drink at the bar, they could go play golf, they'd be in the locker room together, they would develop a different kind of relationship. So to Natalie's point of for as many times as being a woman or a man helps you, it hurts you is in, in the same in the same breath. And so we, we had this conversation that play the hand you're dealt. You're never going to change who you are. And sometimes it'll work in your favor and sometimes it won't. And when I started my first venture back startup, uh, there were no female VCs. I couldn't find a single venture capitalist who was a woman. And so therefore, when they would see me as a female CEO of a startup, they never saw one of those before, so they didn't know what a good one looked like. So I had to kick and claw and scream to get funded. Um, but rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm hearing a lot around resilience, mental toughness, um, the ability to adapt, um, be agile, and to overcome. So as you, as you think about that in your life and in your career, have you, have you had the opportunity to help others develop that same inner core, that toughness, the ability to be brave even when they're terrified, um, the ability to pick themselves up off of the floor and try again, 
um, to go back and ask for, you know, the opportunity again, as you think about that, how did, how did you develop it and how have you helped others or advised others in this space? I think I probably developed it because I, I only have one sister, so I don't come from a family of 12 or six. <laughs> My sister was older than me. My father never, I don't think we ever actually thought there was anything we couldn't do. So there was just always a sense, it wasn't that I couldn't do it, I just had to do it better than somebody else. And he really instilled that in us. I think what I'm finding as I continue to stay in the workforce, it's getting a little harder because the resiliency, so many things have changed the way our world looks at things. Getting people to understand failure is not fatal. Mm -hmm. It happens, you will wake up the next day, eat your yogurt and move on. But it's, I think it's a harder message today for people to take because there's a lot of coddling and understanding that you've got to just sometimes nurture it, lean into the hard feeling, and then move on. I just, I don't think there's a magic bullet for that. There has to be something in you that decides that's what you want to be. So, uh, you know, the first half of my career, through, through my first couple of startups, um, I was motivated by trying not to fail. I refused yeah. to fail. And, you know, that, that was, I was very committed to not failing. And so I didn't, but that takes a lot out of you. Mm -hmm. If that's what you're driving, if that's what's motivating you. And my, my husband has this expression. He's, he's always says, be the ballerina. A ballerina is someone who is, looks just so beautiful and graceful and they're dancing on their toes. And so by the time I got to my third startup, now I was getting more comfortable with it and realizing, okay, who cares if I fail? And once you shift the mindset to uh, wanting to achieve something bigger for your team and you're doing it for a better reason, you'll get more joy out of it. And I think with that comes resiliency is maybe being not afraid. And this gets to what you're saying, Jane, being not afraid to fail makes mm -hmm. you even more powerful. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd just add that sometimes in the failures or in the struggles, the other side of it is is triumphant. Um, mm -hmm. In public policy, you might have a bill that you want to see pass and it doesn't pass. But then in the you know off season, you perfect it and you get it next year. You know, we live to mm -hmm. fight another day. Um, in, in Salt Lake City, I mean, we hosted the Olympic Games in 2002. That was a big career moment for me. Uh, the eyes of the world are on your city. Um, one point, you know, two billion people are watching opening ceremony and it's your hometown. But we had a bid scandal before the Olympics, if anyone remembers that. Yeah. And, uh, but we, we got through it, you know, like we figured out that, um, this type of controversy didn't start in Salt Lake City, but it was going to end in Salt Lake City. And then we went on and put on a really terrific games. And so I think it's just a reminder that when you do fail, when you have tough times, that it's getting through it, that, you know, propels you to new lessons, new horizons, and, and makes you better overall. Your, your mental framework really does, your worldview really can make such a positive, powerful impact in how you, you know, adapt and adjust to situations. A few other pearls that I kind of got out of um, some of what you shared is sometimes it's not a bad idea. It's just a bad time, bad timing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, be resilient. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just the moment, maybe budgets got cut or, or whatever happened. So you have to believe in, in your, in your product, your solution, and then just not give up and find a better way to maybe tell the story or go back at it again at, at the right time. Um, so those are a couple of things, I think. Jane? You used the word adapt. Mm -hmm. I actually think if you just look in nature, the strongest of the species are those that adapt to situations, changes, field conditions. Yeah. So I think that if you freak out at every turn, that will just deplete you of all your energy and your focus. So I think the ability to adapt, and I personally think focus is one of your greatest tools. And I think we talked about this, you know, a lion tamer, has a stool, a whip, and a gun. The most important tool they have is the, is the stool. Because if you're already shooting and whipping the lion, I think the game's kind of over. <laughs> so I think focus is an incredibly important thing to have. And we underestimate it. And we can learn to do it better. So I'm a big fan of that. I want to make a point about being grounded in what you do. Because you mentioned uh, change, the pace of change. 
whether it's technological change, you know, whether it's just, you know, you, you have to be able to change uh, to survive, but it's dizzying and it's mentally challenging and it's it's really ravishing our youth in many ways, the, the way that uh, we feel so many pressures from change. And the way I cope with change is by being grounded at some level, either with my family, with nature, with my faith, you know, whatever it is that brings you to a spot where, you know, you feel peace and you have to just keep returning to that spot because this world is so complex right now with so much disagreement, so much undignified speech, um, so much um, division that it can be, it can be, it could really tear your heart out and you have to find a way to be grounded and then lead, you know, in, in a positive way. You know, this conversation is making me think about something we talked about at the retreat in September. Um, and we were talking about how important our people are to us as a business. And we were, were talking about all the things that we do to make sure they feel valued, appreciated, recognized for their efforts and the contributions they make to our clients and to, to the firm and to each other. And one of the things that um, we talked about was employee engagement. And we talked about some of the things that, um, that, that our leaders do all the time to make sure that we have the right culture. And um, Natalie, you brought up a thing called flow. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that you, you look at and you consider and some of the work that you're doing, would you mind just talking a little bit about what that means and why that's so oh, important? Yeah, sure, happy to. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of the secrets to happiness. And if you think about happiness, you've got to have relationships and you got to have um, achievement. Um, you got to have uh, collaboration, different things. But one of the things you need, you need positive emotions, something good to eat, uh, something good to wear. I mean, those things that you can buy. But in the research, they also talk about flow. Flow is a form of engagement. It means that you're, you're lost in the moment. It's a beautiful thing. For me, I'm a, I'm a team sports player, played a lot of soccer in my career. Uh, right before kickoff, it's like some of the happiest moments because mm -hmm. I know for 90 minutes, I'm just going to be focused on that ball. <laughs> Nothing else can touch me, you know. But uh, I, I flow in work is really important. Mm -hmm. you, you can't come to work and dread it. You have to come to work and feel like, you know, you're part of something bigger than yourself. And it's up to our leaders to help develop that. You have an mm -hmm. responsibility as well. But I find the flow is immensely important to well-being. I, did, I mean, I think it's about how you find joy. And it's really important to find joy in all aspects of who you are, because as a whole person, you have to be fulfilled. You, you can't be getting an A at work and an F at home mm. or an yeah. F at work and an A at home. Like, so you have to have, you have to be getting an A or a B in both, right? At all times, maybe not, uh, maybe sometimes they flip, but you, you can't feel really good about who you are or what you're doing if you're getting an F somewhere. So how do you find that balance? And how do you, if you realize you're going sort of to the left-hand column and you're getting negative, how do you get yourself back to the right? And a lot of times it might just, you might be stuck yourself, but either a mentor or a sponsor or somebody in your circle of support um, can help do that for you as well to bring you back to where you can find joy and where you can get back into the flow. Yeah. I do think when you say, you always used to talk about work-life work balance. I think now it's a little bit more realistic integration. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it can ever be equal. You know, I don't think it's either you're an A here and an F here. Sometimes you might be a C at everything you're doing. and um, I hope not. <laughs> no, you, well, you hope not, but it does happen. And you need those people around you to maybe ground you and correct you. But I think struggling so hard to make everything balanced at, in terms of work, home, children. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think let the joy wash over you and it will happen organically. But when you worry about it, I have to admit, I'm exhausted because I read so many books about, I have to get up at three in the morning to do all the things they're telling me to do. <laughs> it's like, you know, find your center. What's your mission today? Do this, do crossword puzzles. <laughs> you know, walk with your eyes shut, brush your teeth on one foot. I barely can get out of the house. I mean, we generally, it's like this, just so I, I kind of, I'm more, let the joy wash over me and do it organically. And... I think that's great. I, I, I prescribe to, you can have it all. You just can't have it all, all the time. Yeah, same, yeah. So it's about choices and trade-offs, right? Um, and if you're good at doing that and, and having others who care about you, keep you in check, if you're getting too far out of balance, then, mm -hmm. then you'll be, you'll be, you'll be fine. But it's unrealistic to believe you can have it all, all the time. Yeah. Um, and then have that in a sustainable way. 
All right, ladies. So a question for you now, oh. as you reflect um, at the beginning of your career to now where you've progressed, has your leadership style or approach changed over time or not? Um, and if it has changed, how so and why? hundred <laughs> percent. I don't even think you, would, you could identify me from when I was a first leader. Uh, and I think it all stems from the fact that since I was living my life out of avoiding failure and out of fear, I was afraid if my team would fail. So I, that made you a terrible manager in my estimation. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also noticed that there were lots of people when you're working in a larger company, you know, they stick around as the boss are there and they wait till the boss yeah. goes home. And, you know, everything is all about some surface activity. Um, and then... Uh, especially when my first company was acquired by Ask Jeeves and I had to travel to Ask Jeeves and these kids would sleep under their desk with their dogs. And I'm just like, <laughs> and I had a two-year-old. That really happened. I, yeah, I had a two-year-old son. I'm like, I'm not sleeping under the desk yeah. with a two-year-old. So um, I would say that the trigger point for my management style changed when I became a mother because all of a sudden your priorities become very clear. Your child is at the top. And I had moments where I had to, you know, jump on airplanes to go be, to take care of him. Didn't matter what it was. Now, I only had one child. So I think I could have managed what I did with one child. I don't know how a mother would be able to do it with two, especially doing a startup. It just was, was so intense. But what I will say is that I think as a mother, you realize there are things more important than leaving after the boss, then what, whatever those issues are. And it makes you, it frees you up to be a better manager. That's great. I don't know where to start. That was a great like <laughs> setup for oh, well, so many interesting things. I mean, I remember when I worked in Washington and one of my colleagues said to me, oh, so-and-so is a nine to fiver, which was like a shame because you were supposed to work longer than that. <laughs> and, uh, and then I have these same feelings of, of being a mother and knowing that the hardest thing I believe I've ever done career-wise is be a young mother and a professional woman because you're torn so asunder. Um, and I had a supportive husband and family and job and healthy children, but it's, it's, it's really difficult. But I persevered. And I have these wonderful children now and it, it worked great, you know, so you can do it. Um, in terms of a leadership change, uh, just a couple of things. Um, I'm one that likes to get involved in the details and do things myself. That's not a good thing to do when you're a leader. You need to get things off your desk. <laughs> Jane, you're, you're agreeing with me there. Okay. Yeah, I just, um, I, 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 I had to learn how to delegate. And then one other thing that I think was really important in my leadership development was to realize that being a leader wasn't a position, it was an activity. And so we're very, um, at where I work, we talk openly about how everybody's a leader in their own sphere, you know, and it's, it's an act, it's not a position. And leadership is about navigating change. We talked about how much change there is. So we got to get good in every position about seeing around corners, mm -hmm. navigating the future, um, inventing the future, those sorts of things. That's great. My style changed. My core values never changed. Okay. So that was sort of different. I, but my style definitely changed. Uh, the one thing I think, pivoting off of what you just said, understanding that everybody leads from their seat. If you're the receptionist, but you think you are, you know, the CEO of first impressions and you live that, mm -hmm. I think that is so much better than it's a someone. It's beautiful thing. It's awesome. It's perfect. And so... Even though I never had every great title in the world, I always led from my seat because I was the CEO of Jane. So why wouldn't I want to do that? And that's really, and I just, I cultivated skills around other things. But core values stayed the same. The very, very first time I had staff, oh, my staff meetings were horrid. <laughs> I used to feel badly for them. I'm like, why do you even come in this room? And... Uh, but you learn and you learn from everything and build upon it, but you still have to keep that core. Well, that's great. Um, you mentioned something, I think all of you did a little bit around change and there is so much change and there's so much change in the world um, in the past three, three to four years, in some ways unprecedented. 
There's a lot of research today that's talking about change fatigue. And especially as you're thinking about um, the rise of AI and machine learning um, and the change of structures and institutions um, that humanity can't tolerate this a massive tidal wave of change that's coming at them. And so it's it's really affecting people. So I'm curious from, from your perspectives, how you've been able to manage through and deal with that amount of change and in the positions you have today, um, maybe some strategies that, that you maybe are incorporating. Change, I have to admit, I love change. <laughs> Because I think if you don't like change, how do you like irrelevance? So I love change. <laughs> I mean, I just think it's, yeah. well, That's that great. to me is sort of, so I don't freak out about it because I just think it's what life is. And so no, I don't really worry about it. I think yeah. it's exciting because I've been in the same, I've been in the same sort of place, but I've had almost, I've done it from starting out at the lowest entry level moving up, becoming a president, becoming a COO, blah, blah, blah. Then going to what I'm doing now, we're working to buy companies and build this phenomenal platform and family of firms. So I've seen it from both, what I think is fascinating, what I'm doing now feels like the prequel to my whole career. Ah. Because now I'm seeing how it's actually done. So no, I, I love change. Mm -hmm. One of the things I try to bring to the STO building group board is um, a knowledge of economic and demographic trends. And of course, you know, change is afoot, mm -hmm. whether it's how rapidly our uh, society is diversifying, how we're aging uh, economically, the structure's changing. I mean, we came through a pandemic and it opened a whole new world of uh, different behavioral change, structural change and the like. I, I found a, a few rules that helped me. Um, one is you got to keep an open mind. In today's world, you know, whatever you did a few years ago, just be willing to keep an open mind because it might give you insights in a way that's really helpful. A second is in a changing, a rapidly changing environment, you have to listen more. Mm -hmm. There's more voices. Yeah, there's just you got to be a much more attentive listener. And then third, and this is just because I'm so distraught about the division in our society, but you have to unify and dignify because if we let uh, society just rip us apart, try change in that environment mm -hmm. as opposed to all this change and we unify and dignify, treat each, treat each other with dignity, be careful in our speech, um, be kind. You know, I mean, you can just go from there, but you do all those things. Um, change gets to be a lot more fun mm -hmm. and you stay relevant to Jane's point. Yeah. So I, I think about change, you know, I'm in the world of technology. So change, I, I'm always trying to look at a new invention and say, okay, how's that going to change things? But I tend to look at change that's sort of like a, you're out surfing. And you either get hit by that wave or you figure out how to surf that wave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked a lot about skills needed, selling, communication. I think learning how to surf change Oh, is a skill that people need to start to pay attention to is, is that what if everything changed? Like one day we woke up and we couldn't go into the office anymore. We all had to learn how to do meetings over Zoom or how to work remotely, how to stay motivated when you're in your house. Um, so change is something that either crashes you to the beach or you surf off into the, uh, into the future. So um, I think it's a positive thing. I, I love to watch my son solve a problem with a computer. And I think back to when I was his age and how I would have solved the problem. His facility to context switch is so high. And I think that change just came like the ocean wave. It's because he had access to all these tools. And so his brain evolved to go, go with those tools. Jane yeah. reminds me of a, a famous uh, tech entrepreneur in my state who, who, quote, who has this quote, uh, fight change and die. Um, you know, <laughs> deal with change and survive or lead change and prosper. That's, and that's your point of you have to get out in front of the wave. Yeah. Yeah, to catch it. I love it. So we're going to embrace change. We're going to surf change and we're going to unify and dignify. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Beautiful. <laughs> nice. I love it. So um, you all are um, ladies on our board of directors. I'm not sure that, you know, the average person knows what, what that means of what what is it that, that external directors 
do? What is the role that you serve? What do you bring to the table? And how do you assist the executive management team within a business as a member of that board? Who would like to go first? No, I'm sitting next All to right, you. All right, Jane, that's the longest serving it's member. It's the longest serving <laughs> member. Of the um, I think one of the big pivots was because I came out of being in a C-suite job, left that and then ended up on the board, recognized you don't run the company. That I think I watch sometimes certain new board members come in and they want to be operations people. Well, that's what other people do. I think you help with strategy. I think you say best, you sort of help the rough spots. Look, because you have the experience to know what could be coming around the corner. And depending on the structure of the company, there is a governance part of it. Mm -hmm. I just think staying out of the trap of you want to run the company for them, because if you feel you have to, you may not have the right leaders. Mm -hmm. I also think it's really being an arm of them to help whatever they need done. And I think the best part about being on STOBG, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the best people in the business and the teams, because Jim and Bob are so wide open. I had one board I sat on, you could not talk to anybody mm -hmm. in the company without going through him. And there's none of that at STOBG. But I think don't, don't get too into the weeds with your, the company you're serving. Yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, Claudia, what I think of is uh, I'm asked to be there for a reason. Um, the STO Building Group values my economic background, my demographic background, my public policy and political background. And so my job is to come in there and be authentically me. I shouldn't try to be like Jane or Julie. Well, never do that. <laughs> never. <laughs> well, because, you know, they, they bring what they bring. And if we were all the same, you wouldn't need us. You know, but but uh, and I think um, I'm, I'm a big believer in bringing, you know, integrity to the position and bringing insights and authenticity and just just recognizing that by giving your best, you're helping the company. And it's a real privilege to do it because I'm a huge fan of the work that STO uh, Building Group does. And I think boards are at their best when they enhance the life of the executive team. When you're in the middle of the of the firefight as, a, as an executive, you have blind spots, you don't see icebergs ahead. And if you have a diverse board who truly are a sounding board, I think you can really, um, it can make you better as an executive, make your team better as an executive. And so the good thing about the STOBG board is there are lots of diverse talents. Mm -hmm. We have an economist. We have someone who's run engineering businesses. And I've, I'm sort of an innovator. I'm around technology and, and an entrepreneur. So we all bring a different perspective, which is really, which can be really helpful if the management team is open to it as they are on in uh, at STOBG. So great. Specifically, as you think, you mentioned blind spots and seeing around the corner. How do you think effective boards can do that? Well, one of the things is they can create an environment where you're not afraid to speak up, <laughs> you know, because you're sitting around a, a board table with people with a lot of expertise that you don't have, but you might see something. Let's say it's employee engagement. I know from the business literature that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, mm -hmm. right? I'm supposed to speak up and say, you got to pay attention to your culture. People matter. And, uh, and so it's, I think it's super important that you create an environment where people are very willing to, to share and, uh, and, and, and sometimes tell you what you don't want to hear. Important. And, and it's, Again, building on that, because it is, are people willing to hear what you're saying? But when you when you come from a completely different industry, there are no knowns from your industry. So, you know, uh, hacking or what what is ChatGPT going to do to my business? Having access to deeper knowledge about those things can be useful to the executive team. Um, someone that has run, like Jane has, the engineering companies from the ground up, you, you can probably almost with your spidey senses, figure out if something's going, <laughs> something's going off on the culture or on the management. So it's, it's this notion of really just synthesizing the skills of the, of the team that really, uh, and, the, and I think that um, Natalie said it best, is that if the management team is open to hearing it, that's when it's really great. Yeah. 
I would have to say I agree the listening. If if everything is just like, yeah, okay, that's nice. Mm-hmm. Well, meeting adjourned, safe travels. <laughs> that is the worst board to be on. And I agree to feel that you, I believe everybody that's on the boards does have something to contribute. It may be very different from even what you do in your everyday job, but there's something to contribute. And uh, yeah. I have to admit, when I first sat on the board, because I came out of the engineering side, I had to learn a whole new nomenclature. I had to understand money is made differently. So it was very, very different. So there was still a steep learning curve, but there are some absolutes that don't change from business to Mm -hmm. business. So it was interesting. um, We were were talking about some of the the decisions and conversations around the board tables today um, and how it's maybe more divisive today in some ways in businesses and and in the world than it was five or 10 years ago. Um, And we talked um, previously about things like generational gaps Um, technology trends, decline of institutions, pace of change, disruptive technology. Is there a role that companies can or should play in any of this space or that boards can have an influence in or take under advisement or consideration and help advise the firms on? I'm happy to jump in first by just saying that I'm a big fan of what the business community does in this country. And I say that as someone who's a public policy expert. Uh, You know, our governments are struggling right now. We have um, so much uh, disparity in viewpoints. People, when you say institutions, uh, the Supreme Court's being questioned. You know, Congress is being questioned. Um, A lot of times local school boards are being questioned. Uh, These are our institutions of public life, what we do together. And I think business can be a huge bind, uh, uh, well, well, you know, binds maybe not the right word, a big way of binding us together. Uh, you know, the, the old comment that when General, General Motors sneezes, the rest of the nation catches a cold. Well, if you just reverse that and say when business uh, does well, it can be contagious and good things can happen. So I really look for uh, uh, business at both the local level and at the national level to help us remedy some of the problems we're seeing in our associational life or, or government. I don't know how you all feel, but... What a great when, answer. Well, I mean, do you, do you think there's a possibility? I love that answer. And I was also thinking that when I worked at companies like Procter & Gamble and Hewlett Packard, and even now, the divisiveness that you see in the country never exists in the company because we're all rowing our boat towards the same goal. And yeah. so I feel a sense of identity, cohesion, team inside of a company. And so when you are suffering from something like the divisions we see in this world, the way to solve these problems is look for the areas of stability. And I think you're right, Natalie. Yeah. I think it's business is where it's at right now. Yeah, It's interesting, though. I think it's something we should actually talk about at the board. Yeah. Okay. It would be an interesting topic. Because I'd be interested to see if some of the younger employees don't feel that, well, sort of crazy, these boards, what is this, Mm -hmm. you know? So I I think it's a real avenue to explore. (laughs) So I'm going a little bit off script here, um, but you you all are members of the board and you're successful women executives. And Julie, I think earlier you you talked in your role about um, the different um, realities for women and men in the same exact role. I oftentimes hear from from women of, well, gee, I have a hard time networking in the same way that my male counterparts do because I don't golf or um, I have obligations at home and I have to go home for childcare or for homework or or whatever it is. What advice or strategies or techniques um, would you suggest um, to perhaps women and or men um, that have been successful for you in terms of being able to build the network that you have to be able to be successful and credible in the roles that you have today. Thoughts? So I think it starts with being great, be great, because people want to be around you if you're if you're good at what you do. That's number one. Number two, I I think that from early early on in my life, I was taught that life is not fair. You you're dealt a hand, you got to play that hand. And so whether you are great at networking or not great, I know many men who aren't great at networking. I know many women who are great at it. That's a skill. That's a skill like being a redhead is being is a, is a feature. You know, you just, you got a set of skills, 
use them to achieve your goal. I think the real trick is set the goal, decide what it is you want to do, and then just make it happen. Just walk through the wall, make it happen. Use whatever you have to make it happen. And so I always, since I always was, were putting together startup teams, I used to think, you know, the worst thing you could do is just have five redheads around the table. I always was looking for people that were different from me. So if it, so I, I looked for the most diverse team because I'm looking for people who have skills I don't have. And so, you know, I, I, I think that diversity is a great um, source of, of strength. And I think that, you know, play the hand you're dealt. I liked your point about, um, you know, life's not fair. Totally agree. I also think that it's a, it's a lesson in life to build from your strengths. You know, Jane's mentioned she's an introvert. Maybe networking's not your thing. She's not an introvert. <laughs> Let's just put I that one to bed. I'm always working out of my... She's <laughs> not an introvert. <laughs> I'm working out of my, my chronic my point is, either. My point is that whatever your strengths are, double down on them because yes. that's where you've got momentum. And if you try to just always work on your weaknesses, you're just taking on water. And there's just all sorts of ways to succeed. You don't have to be on the golf course to succeed. Mm -hmm. If that's something that comes to you naturally and you enjoy it, want to do it, go for it. If not, make your boss look good by creating value in the talking points you provide. Mm -hmm. You'll be, you know, essential. Mm -hmm. And so just find your strengths and then just load into them. I love that. I'm actually the worst person to talk about this because... <laughs> I lived on the road for 25 years and only went home on weekends. So I had a different, I had a different path. I'm not saying I chose it, but I actually did enjoy it. And so I, I think the freedom to choose the path you choose and then to say, because mm -hmm. one size doesn't fit all. Yeah. Lots of ways. There's just lots of ways. And I like what Julie said about set your goal and figure those steps. Because if you leave it up to everybody else, probably won't go the way you like. It was interesting, though, and, and we know Jane is really not an introvert. I think she <laughs> wants to be an introvert, but even you I'll do. I'll show you my Myers-Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you network so well, you don't, but you don't try. Even last night at dinner, you, you literally were like a hummingbird or a little bee <laughs> pollinating every little table. You just walked around. You knew something about everybody. You had a conversation point with everybody. You you brought everybody into the conversation. You were so inclusive. Um, and that's that's networking at its best, making everybody feel like they belong, having the connection and connecting others. Maybe because I don't think of that as networking. I just think of it as fun. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in people. She has a gracious heart. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so that she's very appealing to people and that makes her seem like an extrovert. Or she is an extrovert. You can be whatever, whoever you want to be. That's right. Wasn't there a book? You earned that right. You earned that right. Um, so I'm curious, as you today um, think about advice you would have for people who aspire to be like you someday, running companies, um, starting companies on boards, or just in leadership, senior level leadership positions, what advice would you have for them? And would your advice be different if you were giving it to a young man or to a young woman? Or would it be the same? My advice would be the same. Um, don't expect it to be fair. I already said that. Always ask for the order. That's my, I learned that in sales. Always ask for the order. Um, you can't start selling until somebody says no. <laughs> Don't let somebody else flunk you. You know, do not, do not accept somebody else's version of you if it's not correct. Those are my. Love it. I got to go to you next because I need more time to think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm with Julie that I, that I would not change it that much. I really think it's so individual. I'm, I wouldn't do it around gender lines. I also agree. Just no to me has always been it's a suggestion. It's just a suggestion. Don't fall apart. And uh, I just feel you just keep going. You know, it doesn't mean you have to. And I have to say, I don't think you always have to be the smartest, the most anything. Sometimes it's the one with the most drive and the most commitment to it. But no, I would not change how I would mentor a sponsor. Mm -hmm. A man or a woman. 
Yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I get this idea of not uh, changing your advice based on lines of gender. I guess I'm just really sympathetic to, to female professionals. And so I'll, I'll just throw that out sure. there. But I work a lot with uh, students in higher education um, and then work a lot with young professionals. And, and then I have uh, a, a two millennial children. I'm always uh, motivated to encourage people to move towards energy. Mm-hmm. Okay, move towards where you're feeling alive, where life's giving back mm-hmm. to you. And I think that's really good advice um, it, because that's what uh, helps you thrive is where you're moving towards where you have these natural energies. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be perfectly correct. You can iterate around a directionally correct mm-hmm. kind of plan. But as long as you're moving towards where you're feeling a sense of energy, I think life will work for you. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, it's interesting, and I know, I think we've talked about this before too, but one size does not fit all. So for me, if I was thinking about giving advice, I don't know that I would give advice differently to, you know, a, a young man or a young woman. I think I'd have to get to know them and know hmm. where they're coming from to be able to know what's important to them. Um, and then based upon their reality, probably tailor to my answer because um, different people have different drivers. And, and But from your experience, you know, you can't leave who you are behind. If you're a woman, you're a woman. If you're a parent, you're a parent. If, if you're a caregiver, you're a caregiver. You bring all of that with you and to you. And you might have some experiences that might be helpful to somebody because of your uniquely who you are that could help them as well. So I think sometimes the answer to me is it depends um, on, on who it would be um, because there is no silver bullet or no perfect answer also. So you mentioned thriving, go to where you thrive. And, and I feel like people thrive when they are leaning into their strengths and when they have their superpower. So I'm curious um, for each of you, what's your superpower? <laughs> Let's make Jane answer that first because she'll be so uncomfortable with it. <laughs> and then part two is if you were a superhero, who would you be? Oh my so we'll goodness. start with just your superpower first, and then we'll come back to who your superpower, who your superhero would be. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> superpower. Superpower? Mm-hmm. Um, I have to tell you something. Continuously curious. Like it. That continuously curious, you never could. I always feel there's something more to know or learn, and I think everybody is pretty interesting. So curiosity. Like it. Yeah. I think my superpower, I want to say it humbly, but is the ability to take complexity and distill it into something simple. And, you know, you need things to be as simple as possible, but not too simple. (laughs) But uh, I do that in economics. I do that in, you know, human relationships and just try to really distill things down to their essence. I think mine is that I just don't give up. I will just chomp onto somebody's ankle and not let go until I get what I want. <laughs> and uh, Sounds like an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was the question of how do you succeed is just you outlast everybody. <laughs> that it, Sometimes that works. And it's just you have to outrun the fastest person who's running, the slowest person who's running away from the bear, right? Um, it's interesting, right? So curiosity, um, resiliency, never giving up, and then synthesizing the ability to make something so complex, simple. Um, all, all very important, very powerful. And I, I think you said earlier, Jane, if I had more time, I'd make a shorter yeah, presentation. Short. <laughs> it's not easy. It's, it's a yeah. real skill and a craft. So if you could be any superhero <laughs> in the world at any point in time, who would you be? Somebody said Spidey Senses before, but. All right, I'll go first because I, I, I don't, I'm not into the superhero thing. So I'll have to go old school and I'd say Superman because when I believe that I can get something done, you cannot stop me. But every once in a while, someone will make me feel bad. That'll be kryptonite or make me feel bad about myself. And then I'm just, you know, I can't, I I can't move. It's my kryptonite. I'm really hesitant to do this, Claudia, and you can cut this if you want, but. uh, (laughs) Oh no, we're leaving it in. (laughs) If I were to pick the superhero right now, uh, I would love to be Nikki Haley. (laughs) (laughs) And I say, well, I say that because um, I think she's so competent and such a great example of a leader. And, you know, regardless of your politics, it's just the notion of her representing the United States of America on the international stage. I think that's really exciting. Now, 
you know, that's a political statement. But the idea is that there are outstanding women that uh, that deserve to uh, represent us at high, high levels. And she's just the latest one I'd, I'd put out there. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, I am so terrible at these kind of questions. That is amazing because I know no superheroes. I know. It's, it's just like, I don't know. And who's the one with the Gumby arms? Are you kidding? I was thinking of Eleanor Roosevelt in a cape. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, so <laughs> you get Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> Nikki Haley, and I get Superman. Okay, so who is the uh, serious person here? <laughs> you could be and one Eleanor of Marvel, Iron one. Man. She's wonderful. There's so many. Yeah, no. I, Thor, I, you could be. You guys changed the question. <laughs> well, that I could definitely do, but I, yeah, I don't know. I honestly can't relate to some of those things, but I guess, I don't know. I'm going to go with Superman because I did like the kryptonite. <laughs> Not so much the, you know, it's that notion that, yeah, it can be tough, but every once in a while, man, that can kill you. So. Yep. It was interesting, the kryptonite, because, and there there is research that suggests that that women sometimes have this this voice that that talks to them about not being good enough, yep. um, and that men actually will apply to a job when they have about fifty percent of the skills or qualifications for the job, but generally women will wait until they get closer to you know eighty ninety percent of the skills or qualifications needed to to do the job, and that 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 kryptonite that you you already recognize that there is this this voice that 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 can help. Sometimes people do it to you, but sometimes you can do it to yourself. How do you, how do you tackle that for yourself? How do you recognize it and then stop that voice and put it back in the box where it belongs? You know, you bring up Superman. I'm, you know, in, in, in Park City, Utah, we have the Sundance Film Festival, just ended. Uh, but I went and watched the film Superman. Uh, it's oh. the life story of Christopher Reeves. Oh, boy. Yeah. And, you know, tell me how interesting that is to be Superman on the big screen and then have a, a you know, an accident riding a horse and become a quadriplegic. And uh, I got to meet his children. They were at the uh, debut of this film. But there's a story of triumph, you know, a, a man that reached that high and then had that happen in his life. And it, it's been 20 years since he passed. And um, his ch children finally felt like they could tell the story. Wow. It became a documentary at, at this year's Sundance Film Festival. I'll wow. watch it. Yeah. I think specifically to the question, I think when all these negative thoughts that you keep pouring into yourself, I don't garden, but I get the concept. Like, get rid of the weeds. I, to me, those are all weeds in my brain. So mm -hmm. just de-weed my brain and get them out of there because you hold those, those are the things you will carry all day, all week, all month, all year. So just weed them out. And literally, and sometimes write it down, what you're weeding out of your head. So great. I'm big at weeding those things yeah. because they'll kill you. Yeah. Really important question and really important thing to notice is what's your little voice saying and how do you change that little voice? For me, it's just surrounding myself by people who are always talking positive. So you know when you're in a toxic situation, you need to get out of it because it's just going to make you behave or it's going to become your kryptonite. Mm -hmm. And there's and good places to go. Yes. There's always alternatives. Um, and sometimes you're in a team at work and the team is toxic to you and you you're, it's your kryptonite. So you keep getting worse. And as a manager, it's your responsibility to make sure everybody is performing at the highest level. And you got to make sure there's no kryptonite floating around that office. So... Mm -hmm. Were there ever, and we weren't prepared for this question, I'm just curious, in, in your career, were you ever in that type of a situation where it was so toxic for you, where you felt like, or you recognized it was so toxic for somewhere else, where you realized, I just need to make a change um, now or, or as soon as I possibly can. I'm just, without going into any details or disclosing the company, but I'm just curious, you know, how you observed it and, and what you did to to help yourself have the courage to get out of it. Because sometimes people just stay and then it has all these negative, even health effects um, and things that you bring home, other stressors um, and anxieties that can be created. So I'm, I'm just curious if you ever had one of those situations and, and what you did to, to, to get yourself in a healthy place again. Well, for me, I have a, I had a goal. I was going to be an entrepreneur and I was going to get there no matter what. So if I found myself in a toxic situation where people around me were not enhancing my life, 
I would change it. But I, I feel like part of being an entrepreneur is being very empowered and just believing, well, if, if this group is not for me, what else is in this company that I can do with a better environment? Mm -hmm. And if I couldn't find that, I would walk away. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not a quitter. I mean, I just told you my superpower was I don't give up. But staying around in a situation that does not support your mental health is not a good thing. Yeah. And I would say no one gets through a career unscathed. There's always moments in your career where you're in difficult situations. You just figure it out. Then I have quit just for the, <laughs> just for the record. I'm not a martyr because I don't think it ever works well for the martyr. So I don't say <laughs> I'm going to keep doing this. And, and I just had a situation and I, again, measured the decision on every dimension, willing to accept the consequences. And it was the best thing I ever did. I never looked back. And I was very frightened because I was in public sector. It was my first foray into the private sector. And I was scared to death, but it was the best thing but that ever happened. The fear propelled me, <laughs> and I was out of the toxic situation. So I, I also would. think it's incumbent on leaders to recognize toxic situations and make changes where they need to be made. Um, I've had times when I've inherited a bad situation, and I dealt with it, and the person before me didn't, you know, and I, I, I think you've got to deal with bad situations. And generally, uh, it's amazing in a toxic situation how it's generally one person can change the whole dynamic, yes. good, either good or bad. And if you recognize what that is and you change it, it's worth doing. And it's, I think it's your responsibility, as Natalie said. If you had one powerful point that you could share with anybody listening to the podcast today, if they got nothing else out of the entire time together, what would that powerful point or message be? And it could be something that somebody else said. It doesn't have to be something that you said. I'm, I'm just going to go with believe in yourself. Um, you're in this world for a reason. You have life experiences that have shaped you and made you who you are. And if you believe in yourself and apply yourself, um, as I mentioned, pick a directionally correct path, iterate around it, move towards energy, you'll be successful. Great. I love it. Someday you're going to be sitting here 30 years back, looking back over your career. And this moment that you think is, you know, life is ending at this moment, you're going to look back and go, oh, that was no big deal. <laughs> and I look back at the worst things that ever happened to me and I'm like, oh, what was I worried about? So nothing is ever as good as it seems and never as bad as it seems. It's great. I know this one will surprise you. I think you have to, we have to have all the other, everything we've talked about today, but I have to say find the funny, <laughs> because it makes the rough patches so much better when you can find the funny and have those people in your circle that make you laugh at yourself. And I, I'm a big believer in just don't keep beating yourself up. It's take the ear shirt off. You can do that. So I, I would say, I think it's a pivot of what you said. It's just, I think there were things where I dissected proposals and presentations if it didn't go well. And I look back on it now and I, I don't even remember it. Well, I don't remember a lot of things now, but particularly that. Well, I have to, to say, um, I'm sad that we're getting to the end of the podcast time together now, but um, this has been so inspiring to me and I've really enjoyed every moment. The three of you are incredible individually, but collectively, um, the insights, the wisdom, and, and the energy that you bring is truly incredible. And it's been really fun to see you all coming together. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of the STOBG team and all of our people um, for sharing with us and being being truly authentically yourselves and sharing um, sometimes, you know, things that are very humbling and frightening, but it's we're all just people ultimately, and we're all here to help each other. So I want to say thank you again. Um, and I got a lot out of it, and I hope that you all got something out of it for each thank other. Thank you too. to you and your whole team. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.